Good morning. Didn't know what to think. Sitting up here, it looked a little, a little lackluster to begin with. I hope you got some life in you, some life, some spiritual funk, something. There you go. Somebody, somebody, help me, Jesus, help me. Somebody, please. Well, we are where we are, right in the middle of, or right at the beginning, really, of challenge of change. Change for us collectively, which means change for us individually, that infects infects the rest of us, affects the way we operate as a community, right? And it's, it's about becoming outreach-oriented. It's about learning how to reach out. Really, the learning is the easiest part. This right here, this is the easiest part. I can teach you what you need to know. You can memorize verses. You can kind of rehearse uh, scenarios in your mind of what you might say here and there, you know, whatever it is that helps you. This is the easy part. It's when an opportunity comes right up to your right up to your grill right pulls right up to your to your uh in front of your nose and what are you going to do when you're sitting there and you're talking to someone you're in the midst of a conversation you are they are in uh possibly a a crisis type situation the depths of despair whatever it is are you going to offer them the only true hope you have which is eternal life through jesus christ our lord We're not talking about bashing people over the head with scripture, conversion by concussion, one hammer blow after another. That's not the idea. It is the truth spoken in love. Are you with me? That's that's the key. Truth spoken in love. The truth is, is love is protected by truth. The truth is meant to be surrounded by love. That's eternal. That's powerful. That's triumphant. The key, one young lady said it best up here in the prayer time last Sunday, and I'm just going to repeat her words. She said, the most, Im- the most important aspect of, of uh, sharing the gospel is being unashamed about it. For I am not ashamed, Paul said, of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone. Jew, Gentile, black, white, red, yellow, brown. Doesn't matter. That is the power of God. Jesus Christ died on the cross for every sin ever committed. He not only died on the cross, if that's the end of the story, then we got really nothing to look forward to. Our sins are forgiven, yes, but we're never coming out of the grave. Great, wonderful. That's fantastic. Well, what, what good is that going to do us? He rises from the grave. He conquers sin, death, and darkness. He ascends to the Father's right hand as King of kings and Lord of lords, conquering, right, leaving in his wake all the thrones, dominions, powers, and authorities, the entire demonic and angelic realms. He is the risen king of the universe. That's the full gospel, the cross, the resurrection, the ascension. Everything that you need to live life fully in and from his kingdom has been done for you. I thought that was just a great piece of insight. The most important part of sharing the gospel is being unashamed about it. Unashamed. Do you get all weird, all squeamish and squirmy and weird when you have to talk to somebody and you're like, oh gosh, I think I'm supposed to give them the gospel, but I'm not sure and I don't know, you know, are they going to think this, are they going to think that? In the end, eternity's counting. What... What does it matter? Who cares what they think? The only issue in that, for the only issue for someone that we know is unsaved is what do you think of the Son of God? What do you know about Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he is who he said he was, the Son of God, and that he did what he said he would do, and that is pay the price for the sins of the world? That's the only thing that matters. All the arguments and all the, the, the political ideology, all the uh, religious ideology they may hold from whatever background they come from, none of that matters. We can argue it all day long. We can, you know, weeks on end, months on end, whatever. And in some cases, you may have to hang in there with somebody and listen to a lot of that smack. But none of that stuff ultimately is the issue. It is Jesus Christ and faith in him. It's just that simple. Now, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn this in a little bit different direction. It is fully in line with what we're doing but I want to simplify something for you. And I just want to show you this morning. And if you've, got, if you've got a notebook, an iPad, anything in front of you, please, this will help you be prepared to share the gospel. I'm going to give you plenty of verses. I'm going to show you just how simple this is. This is the simplicity of salvation, redemption. Now, I think this is important because it's a, it's a matter of balance. And we come from a background that is accurate in the gospel and accurate in the fact that uh, the security of the saints is the security of our salvation is held right there in the hands of God. We didn't do anything to earn this redemption. 
right? We didn't work for it. We didn't labor for it. We didn't earn it. It's grace. It's a gift. And in the same way, Jesus says, my sheep I hold in my hands, John chapter 10, the Father, I and the Father are one. He has his hands around my hand. The sheep are secure. I don't know what you think you can do to squirm out of the hand of God, but I doubt it, whatever it is. Whatever it is rolling around there in your melon, probably not going to work for you. And that's, frankly, I don't know about you, that lifts a lot of weight off. Like, oh, I got saved by grace, but now I got to stay saved by works. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Sh- call me. That's not good news. Call me when you have a perfect day. I don't mean that the weather's great and you're on vacation and the margaritas are tasting fine and, you know, I don't mean all that. Oh, it's a perfect day, right? Until they get your order wrong. And you're like, man, it was a perfect day. <clears throat> you know, okay? Call me when you have a perfect day. When you are perfectly kind, perfectly loving, perfectly patient, perfectly compassionate. When you are perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect for 24 hours, call me. I want to mark it down as a golden day. We will celebrate it as a holy day. One member of Heart's Journey had a perfect day. See, if, you, it's a matter of, if it's a matter of getting saved by grace and staying saved by works, you better learn how to be perfect fast. Now, we're in the process of being conformed to Jesus' image. It's interesting because when he tells his people, be perfect as your, his disciples, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, in the passage in Luke, he says, be merciful as your father is merciful. Same type of teaching. One is the, one is the Sermon on the Mount, right? The, the discourse on the hill. The other one is the Sermon down on the plain. You got one in Matthew, one in Luke saying the same things. But then he says, be merciful as your father is merciful. See, that's, that gives us an insight into what God considers to be perfect. Mercy. Mercy. We like justice. We want to see people get what they deserve. And the truth is, if you turn it around, if we all got what we deserved, no one would be here right now. I mean, that's a fact. No one would be here, and I would be the first one gone. That's a scary thought. I am grateful for mercy because mercy has removed from me and you and anyone else that trusts in Jesus Christ, removed from us the condemnation that we rightfully deserved. Grace gave us the blessing and the benefits that we could never earn and we did not deserve. See, that's how mercy and grace work together perfectly, beautifully. And I thank God for that. So I want to show you the simplicity of salvation, just how easy it is. Now, that's our background of, of uh, a clear gospel message and the security of the saints. But listen, there's another, there's another side of this. This is not the focus this morning, but keep this in mind. When we're calling people into a relationship with Abba, with the Father of heaven and earth, through faith in Jesus Christ, his Son, that's exactly what we're calling them into, his kingdom a submission and surrender to his authority, a relationship with him. You are the son, he is the father. You are the daughter, he is the father. Who has the authority, right? Who, whose will is more important? Let's just humble yourself for a moment and answer the question. Whose will takes supreme importance in this relationship? Abba's does. God's does. Jesus does. The Spirit's does. Okay, we are calling people into a relationship with the Son of God. To be a disciple means to be not just a student, not just a learner, but a follower. That I'm walking in his footsteps. I desire, however imperfectly, fireball, I desire to put into practice the teachings of Jesus. Especially, friend, relationally. Especially relationally. That is the deepest level of holiness that we have available to us, Joan. How we treat other people. How we treat other people. We can talk, I mean, we can legalists love to hold up the fact that they don't drink, don't dance, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't go with the girls that do, or I don't go to R-rated movies, or I don't, you know, what, they, they got all these things that, you know, I don't do this, or I do that, or I don't, whatever. And rule keeping is substituted for relationship with Jesus and with others. And let's be honest, when you see somebody that is satisfied with their own standard of righteousness, aren't they just miserable to be around? Good heavens. People, listen. Sinners, pagans, tax collectors, cultists, prostitutes, everybody loved hanging out with Jesus. Now that's kind of a slangy term, hanging out. Everybody loved to be with this man. Why don't sinners like being with us? Are you tracking? Now maybe they do. I hope they do. I'm saying I'm using that for the whole of Christianity. Because I think most of you people are pretty good in this arena of being, uh, being able to uh, be non-judgmental, be in any setting, anywhere, and, uh, and let Jesus shine. Most of you. I don't know every single, you know, <laughs> how every, every one of this would work. But I know some of us do. I can blend in anywhere. And I don't mean by doing what everybody else is doing. I simply mean I'm not, I'm not there to, to judge, to condemn, to do whatever. 
If you want to know the way out, I got an open door right here. I can show you the light. If you're in darkness, I can show you the light. But you think about that. Read the scriptures. People loved being around Jesus. The worst people of his day, considered by the religious crowd to be the scum of the earth, they love the Son of God. The religious crowd, considered by the quote-unquote scum of the earth to be holier and loftier and more righteous than the rest of us, they hated him, and they put him to death. Now, what does that tell you when you take that picture and you transplant it into postmodern Christianity? It's crazy. We've got this whole thing reversed. We, we lift up these people as being the best and the, the baddest spiritually. And sometimes because of the way that they judge others and their arrogance or their self-righteousness or whatever, they are the worst. Just think about it. Whole reversal. Thank God for grace. And remember, we're calling people into a relationship with the Son of God. They are meant to become not just believers, but followers. Followers, Judy. That's a different story. They need to know that from the beginning. They need to know what they're getting into. This is not just fire insurance. It is that. Listen, it is that. That's kind of a funny term, fire insurance. It is that, but it's not just that, Scotty. It is about calling them into discipleship, following, learning. Listen, when you, when you pull somebody through the door, Beth, into the kingdom of God, you're probably the one that's meant to disciple them. You tracking with that? Go forth, make disciples. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm giving it to you. Go as you're going. Make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I commanded you. If you're the one who shares with them the message of grace and helps pull them in from the, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, you're probably the very one God has designed to disciple them. Are you prepared to do that? Do you have anything to offer this individual? That's what this time is about. Pay attention for your own hearts and for the hearts of others. And I don't mean just today. I mean every Sunday. That's why we gather in some sort of a, a setting where we can worship collectively and communally so that we can uh, learn the word of, God, word of God, we can grow in grace, we can learn how to pray together effectively, we can be prepared and equipped in some way, shape, or form. My job is to prepare you and equip you for the work of service. My job is not to do all the service in the world. That's not a shepherd's job. Read Ephesians 4. It's to equip you for the work of ministry. If you're not engaged in ministry, you're not engaged in making disciples, you're not sharing the gospel, that's between you and God, and you, my friend, have a problem. That's not my problem. Now, I said to you, uh, I think last week, you know, I'll, I'll go with you. If you have somebody, a family member you've been praying for, you have a situation with a neighbor or whomever, and you, you, you want them to get the gospel, I will go with you. I will not go without you. What I will not do is we will not cold call these people out of the blue. You will establish a relationship, some type of connection there, and you will discern through the Holy Spirit when a good time is. And you'll say, hey, you think Wednesday night that... Uh, I could bring my pastor over, maybe, or maybe a couple of men from my church, or a couple of people, or whatever. You know, we just like to come talk to you about Jesus, and whatever. You will set up something, and then we'll go. I will go with you, but we will not just go knock on doors out of the blue of somebody because you think uh, today might be a good day. This, this is simply a matter of prayer. And I'm, I'm going with you, right? We're just not going at, uh, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning on a weekday or whatever when <laughs> they're just getting up to get their morning coffee and off to work or you know whatever are you tracking i'm not trying to make this a negative thing are you following what i'm saying i'm with you we're just not going and sh we're not going to surprise people and kicking their door in right that's not we're not doing that we're not doing that we're going to wait for god's timing uh so anyway let's pray father i'm so so grateful for this morning move us encourage us inspire us jesus we need to know what it was you said about yourself. What did you say you were going to do? What does it take to be redeemed, to be delivered, to be reconciled to God, a sinful man or woman to a holy and righteous God? What does it take? The grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. May you soak that message down into our souls. May you give us the courage and the boldness to unashamedly unashamedly proclaim it. It's not a matter of volume. It's not a matter of getting louder. That's not what it means to be unashamed. It means I just simply, I simply state what I believe. Here it is. You don't have to believe it, but we're not going to argue about it. The word of God is clear. Here it is. This is the offer of life. I'm offering you life or death this very day, this very moment. What do you want? What do you want? Jesus, open our eyes this day and sanctify our hearts in your holy and beautiful name. Amen.
The simplicity of salvation, the greatest stumbling block to men and women entering eternal life, listen, it's the legalism which adds to the message of grace and obscures the simplicity of, this, of uh, salvation. Here's what happens. Man, by his very nature, in order to feed his ego, in order to feel good about himself, to feel worthy, he wants to do something to earn his salvation. This is universal. All religions are built on the idea of man ascending a, a, a kind of a ladder or uh, making his way around a, you know, a pie chart, a Buddhist pie chart of some kind, or a Hindu, you know, going through levels of uh, the, uh, what the Greeks called the eighth or the, you know, the air, the heavens, ascending in some way, and you do this, and you learn that, and you do this, and you learn something else, and you, you make your way higher and higher. Whereas God says, listen, I've done everything you need. Trust me, trust my son, and I make you one of my own. I adopt you as my own, my son or daughter. Man likes to feed his ego. Do you, is there any doubt about that statement? By man, I mean mankind, by the way, ladies. I'm not leaving you out. I don't want to be, I don't want to be sexist here and leave you out of the equation because we know you have an ego as well. Sometimes, not always. But we love you. What would life be without you? A lot cheaper. Man wants to do something to earn his salvation. I'm joking. Come on. Man wants to do something to earn his salvation. God says it's a precious gift of grace because Jesus Christ paid its price on the cross. He bought, he bought eternal life for every man, woman, and child. How does one acquire it? How do you get this gift? If it's a gift of grace, Sid, then surely there's a way to receive it. Very simple. You must receive it by faith, Marshall. Trust, belief, they're all synonyms. The gift must be received by faith. Trembling with fear, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, kurioi, same word we use for Lord. It's a term of respect. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? To which they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus. That's what's called an aorist tense verb, by the way. That means right here, right now, in this moment, believe. Not even, it, they're not even saying, keep on believing. Sometimes for lifestyle, uh, lifestyle verbs, we have a present tense. Loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Constantly, continually, always loving him. This is not a present tense verb. This is an aorist tense. It means right here, right now, in this moment. On a graph or on your paper, it would look like just a dot. Zzz, believe, right there. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Right here at this moment in time. But let me give you. Nine things, this won't take too long, which salvation is. Nine things salvation is, which not only simplify, but clarify the issue. Salvation is as simple as coming when called. When you were a kid, your mom ever leaned out the door, hey, get over here, <laughs> right? If you were halfway down the block or something. Have you ever been, have you ever been called anywhere at work, at, uh, at school, at home? Right? Somebody calls your name or, hey, how's it going? You see them across the room somewhere. That is how simple salvation is. It's coming when called. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. You know what that means? It means burdened under the shame of your own sin. You know what also men in Jesus' day? Weighed down with religion. With religion. I don't know about you. I am sick of Christian religion. I don't like it. I don't want any part of it. I don't want to be bound by it. Weighed down with religion. Religion is not about relationship. Religion is about what you, by your own efforts, with your own ingenuity, your own uh, strength, energy, whatever, what you can do to satisfy God as opposed to what Jesus has already done. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened under the shame of your own sins, said our Lord, and I will give you rest. That's the eternal rest of salvation. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Matthew eleven twenty eight. It is as simple as drinking water. Is there anybody in here who can't drink water? I mean, literally something is stopping you. Your mouth, your throat, your ability to swallow. Is there anybody that can't drink water? Most of the people you meet are going to fall in this category of being able. And I'm, I mean, I'm, no, I'm serious. They're going to be able to drink water. Therefore, this analogy will work for them. If they can't drink water, they can probably come when somebody calls their name. If they can't come when someone calls their name and they can't drink water, they, they may be able to... Uh, they're going to be able, certainly, to eat, even if it's through a tube of some kind, or they wouldn't be here. Salvation is as simple as drinking water. 
to the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus said, But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. John 4.14. 4, That's with the Samaritan woman at the well. John 4.14. 4, Jesus stood, John 7.37, cried out loudly to his generation, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Let him come to me and drink. Now, those are present tense verbs. Let him keep coming back to me, back to the source of spiritual refreshment and renewal, and let him keep on drinking over and over. Pictures a relationship. But then here he says here, he tells him, how do you get into this relationship? Whoever believes in me, he told his fellow Jews, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. That's John 7, 37 and 38. Rivers of living water, torrents of living water. This is how you know your life is having an impact and an effect. Not only is a river of living water flowing out from your innermost being, not only is your thirst being quenched by God, but now your life is beginning to flow outward and it's starting to quench the thirst of other people. Does that make sense, Ron? That, that's how you know that there is, there is at least, you can see some impact, even if it's not something radical or dramatic or whatever we like to see, and everybody likes to see that occasionally, there is your, that, that living water is flowing and it's starting now to quench the thirst of other people. It's starting to touch their lives. That's pretty cool. Good job, buddy. You know, whip that up on the spot. I didn't, that's not my uh, presentation, by the way, but I like it. Salvation is as simple as eating bread. Can you eat bread? If you can eat bread, raise your hand. Have you eaten bread ever? Okay. Then it's as simple as eating bread. We're going to break bread when we get done here, and we're going to break uh, this bread right here, which represents uh, the, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. We're going to celebrate communion, the uh, sacrament, if you will. I love that term not because I am secretly a Roman Catholic, but because I'm not. Uh, that would shock you, I'm sure. Hey, really? You are? But because that word sacrament comes from the Latin sacramentum sacramentum and a sacramentum was a soldier's oath of loyalty to his legion and his legion's commander are you with me a soldier's oath of loyalty in rome to his legion and his legion's commander in fact they had the number of their legion tattooed burned into their arms that's where you belong. This is, the, this is your line of battle. This is your place. These, this man to your left and to your right, these are your fellow warriors on the field. Hold your ground. Stand firm. Advance in ranks, etc. All that type of language is used in Scripture. Meaning, listen, you are not a, you're not the lone ranger. You're not a one-man army. There is no army of one. That's a load of postmodern crap, and you know it. Army of one? Army of one. That seems a little oxymoronic. Am I missing something? An army of one. Army is a collective concept, right? A plurality. Army is all of us together moving towards the same objective, marching in ranks, standing side by side. <laughs> I mean, not off doing my own thing. There's, there's importance in, this, uh, in these ideas. That's what that breaking that bread is about, declaring our oath of loyalty to our legion and to our legion's commander, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's bowing our knee before the Son of God, reaffirming our worship, submitting, and once again, our will to his. Here's what he said about eating bread. In John chapter 6 and verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And again, in verse 51, I am the living bread, the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone, that sounds pretty inclusive to me, does it not to you? If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. That sounds like a declarative statement. I don't know, Don, right? If anyone eats of this bread, I am the living bread. So he's going to tell you, right? I am the living bread. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone, that would be anyone, anywhere, at any time, eats of this bread, he will live forever. I want to live forever. I like that idea. I think that's a pretty good offer. I can eat bread. It's pretty simple. Are you seeing the simplicity of this? If you can drink water, swallow it down. If you can put bread in your mouth, chew it up and swallow it down. You got this. It's just that simple. 
we're talking about we're talking about not making a leap of faith, a leap into the dark. The faith that, that it takes to believe in Jesus Christ and to walk in his kingdom is a matter of leaping into the light. It's trusting what the word of God says, that there is a higher authority. I'm going to trust that uh, what Jesus said is absolutely true. It's as simple as entering a door. Everyone here came through a door on their way in. In fact, two just to get into this auditorium. If you've been down the hallway, you've been through another one. If you've been into any one of the rooms, you've been through another one. Everyone here has entered at least two doors this day, right? Do you agree with that? Salvation is as simple as entering a door. Using this figure, Michael, of the good shepherd and his sheep, Christ said, I am the door. What he meant in John chapter 10 and verse 9 was the gateway to the sheepfold. The word thura, T-H-U-R-A, means an opening, an entrance. It means the way in. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He didn't say whoever enters through whatever path they can imagine in their own minds, whoever enters through Buddha and Confucius and uh, their ancestors or, you know, spirits of nature, whatever. He didn't say whoever enters through whatever they can come up with on their own will be saved. He said, Joe, whoever enters through me will be saved. And listen, that message never varies from the lips of Jesus. That message never varies. There's never, it's through me and then do this. It's through me and someone else. It's through me and whatever else. Never varies. It's always through faith in me. His characteristic call of discipleship when he was on this earth is follow me. Follow me. Which implies enter into a relationship with me through faith. Now, I want you to walk with me. Walk with me and let me teach you how to live in and from Jesus' kingdom. I mean, in and from God's kingdom. Let me teach you how to live from the resources of God's kingdom. But it's as simple as entering a door. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. People don't like that. I can tell you. They, they, they do not like the exclusivity of Jesus. They like his in inclusivity. Oh, yeah. Anyone. Anyone can be saved no matter what you've done. It's all good. Jesus paid the price for your sins. Oh, that's wonderful. That sounds fantastic. When I, you know, and, I, and I believe that. People are like, oh, I believe it. Yeah, 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 I believe that. You know, I got this cousin. I mean, I mean, she just doesn't, she just thinks that, you know, whatever. She's just a good person, and she believes in sort of karmic retribution. You know, you do good, good comes back to you. You do bad, bad comes back to you, you know. You know. And she just thinks Jesus, that's, that's too narrow, you know. She, and I, I don't want to believe that she could possibly burn in hell. Well, I don't want to believe that either. But it is what it is. I don't, I don't relish that thought for any member of the human race. But there is a... There is a spiritual death that we are born with. It's a condition we were born into. And if that spiritual death combines with a physical death, you've got a future called the second death. Are you tracking with this? If you die physically in a spiritually dead condition, your future is what is called in Scripture the second death. That is the lake of fire. And I, I, I have nobody that I hate that much on earth that I would wish that on. I don't, I don't desire that for anybody. God doesn't desire that for anybody. God desires that all men repent and come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's Peter's message, 2 Peter 3, 9. God is long-suffering with us. He desires that all men be saved. But listen, some people won't be saved because they don't want what God has to offer. And that's a part of the stumbling block. Jesus alone. Through me, you will be saved. Through anyone else, you will not be saved. It's just that simple, and you, we, can, we can rationalize it and try to figure out a way around it, but it is what it is. You can, <laughs> Scotty and I were talking one day, and we both came to this conclusion, you can believe whatever you want to believe. You just can't justify it from the Word of God, from Scripture. You can believe whatever. I mean, you can come up with any wacky thing you want. You just can't say, that's what the Bible teaches, because when you open the Scriptures, you had better be able to say, there it is. Or here and here and here and here means this. And you cannot pick and choose the ways. There is one way through the Son of God alone. It's hard for me to understand, Ford, how people stumble over this because I love the fact that Jesus did everything and opens the way of salvation. I broke down the barrier between us and God, tore down, tore down the, uh, the curtain in the temple and opened a new and living way for us to enter into God's presence. I have no problem with any of that. I have no problem with the exclusivity. I want to worship him. I long for a good king. I have no problem with this. No problem whatsoever. But the world, with its mindset 
of, you know, I don't want to don't want to offend anybody, and I don't want to be, I don't, wanna, I don't want anybody to be left out, right? Some people get left out because they choose to be left out. Jesus' work embraces and enfolds the whole of humanity. Everybody is welcome, but not everybody will take advantage of that welcome. The arms of grace are wide open to all on the cross, but not everybody will take advantage of it. And that's the reality of it. If you can walk through a door, Sid's got Sid's birthdays today. 88 years old. 88 years in a fallen world. And we, we sang happy birthday to him uh, before we began the music this morning. And I'm sure, uh, I know he's got several family members up there in BB. He will receive a gift at some point in time today. Wouldn't you think? It's his birthday. Do you, you agree with that? We, we're really, we're lagging today. I don't know if the coffee's not, was decaf or what, but it's like, oh man, I don't know. Maybe someone gets a present, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, people usually get presents on their birthday, right? On Jesus' birthday. We get presents on Jesus' birthday. How weird is that? That's weird, isn't it? Oh, but we got to do it. We got to do it. We can't, we can't have Christmas without presents. I mean, oh man. Oh, yeah, you can. You can. It's as simple as receiving a gift. It's that simple. It's that simple. This is my beloved remote. I love this remote. It's my remote. I am going to give Ron my remote. Would you like this remote, Ron? There you go. Ron just got remotely saved. (laughs) He received a gift. Ron was sitting there not doing anything to earn or deserve that gift. But Ron gladly took it. That, my friends, is a picture of the simplicity of salvation. You can receive a gift from God. That's how simple it is. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages, the payment, this, is, uh, this was used in the ancient world for the rations of a Greek foot soldier. The rations that he received, the wages, the payment of sin is death. Spiritual death means separation from God and all that he is. All that he is, Mark, light, life, and love forevermore. That's the eternal wages, the eternal payment, the eternal rations of sin, death, separation from God and all that he is forevermore, his light, his life, his love. But the free gift of God, the free gift, really, if you think about it, a gift that costs you something is not really a gift, right? Right? I mean, if you, someone says, well, I got this gift for you. It's only going to cost you 50 bucks. I mean, I paid 100 for it. I'm only asking you to pay half. Well, what we did, we went in half on an investment, the two of us together. You didn't give me. I mean, it's a gift. You didn't give me anything. A gift is just a gift. And we, you know how we've talked about, there's, a ter- there's two terms, right? two lifestyle action ideas that we've been throwing out for the past four or five years here. Live generously and love graciously. Loving graciously is kindness, is compassion, it's forgiveness. Living generously might be materially, it might be financially, it might be time-wise, it might be, again, it might include the idea of forgiveness as well, being generous with other people, with their hearts, caring toward other people. Live generously, love graciously. I know people that will, that will I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll sell their dead grandmother's last pair of high heels, you know, on eBay or something. I mean... It's like, dude, you know, you could just give that away, you know, and that would be another option, right? I mean, do you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's people that just, they'll, they will just sell anything, everything, and that's fine. If you need money, that's okay. But if you, if you don't really, if you don't really need it, you just find somebody that does need it and give it to them. My wife and I have employed this for years. It's like, I'm not, I'm not selling you this. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not loaning you 20 bucks. If you need it, here's 20 dollars. Just take it. I, it's not, you know, well, I'm going to pay you back. Yeah, that'll never happen anyway. So let's just get rid of all the mess between us and just here you go. We'll just give it to you and just go on, right? That's an example of just living generously, you know? If you got a car, you know, you sell your used car, right? Uh, but you know, we're talking about maybe little smaller scale items. If somebody needs it, just give it to them. Like live generously. This is the free gift of God. It doesn't cost us anything. That's grace, the capital G. You know what grace is? Grace is God's 
riches. Grace is God's resources. Grace is God's righteousness at Christ's expense. You hearing that? God's riches. God's resources. God's righteousness at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. That's grace. The free gift of God, Peggy, is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Anybody ever received a gift in this room? You can get saved. That easy. It's as simple as calling for help. (laughs) Help me. I've fallen and I can't get up. Right? Actually, that's not a bad analogy to being spiritually dead. Help me, God. I have fallen and I have no idea which way is up. I am flying upside down. That's what the world is doing. You think things look crazy? Just understand, to the world, they don't look crazy. Because the world is flying upside down. They're flying upside down. So all this, all this chaos that goes on, I mean, you just think, man, we go from one scandal to another in government. We go from one war to another in, in sometimes in the same parts of the world. We go from one virus or outbreak of this or outbreak of that to another. It's so crazy, it doesn't even phase us anymore. It is nuts out there right? We're talking like, like Joker and Batman nuts. I mean, it is wacko. And it, I mean, I mean, I read, I read the paper all the time. I like to stay up with stuff. I keep up with things on, you know, on news sites on the internet. And I was like, man, this is, this is squirrely. It is, it's crazy. The, the craziest thing is like the police beat. You read that part of the, 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 the Arkansas section of the, it's like, man, that is, that's, you can't make this up. You cannot make this up, right? Somebody going to the police office, to the, to the police station to collect their drugs. Yeah, that's mine. I mean, you can't make that kind of stupidity up. I mean, there's stuff in the paper you see. People with uh, driving cars with seven pounds of meth and the, and the lights don't work, the brake lights don't work or something. You're like, yeah, you could have sold a pound of meth and fixed the lights before you cross state lines with this stuff. I mean, it's like, you cannot make this up. Well, I noticed that the cop was behind me. Notice he didn't have any brake lights. Pulled him over and went, seven pounds of meth and hidden in a speaker box or something. like, what in the world, man? You know, you say, like, that is crazy. And robbing and killing and stuff going on all over. Ladies, yeah. Oh, we, we, I read this. I read, oh, my gosh. Like Wyoming or somewhere. Guy breaks into a house, okay, steals some stuff leaves. Cops catch him within two hours. You want to know how? While he was in the house, decided he was going to log on to Facebook. (laughs) On to Facebook in a house he was breaking into. And then he left his home page up. He left his page up with his name and picture on it. With his name and his picture on it. Sweet sons of monkeys. You can't you can't beat a man to that kind of stupidity. I mean that is crazy. What was the other one? Left his wallet behind? Robbed a bank and left his wallet on the counter. On the counter. Sweet Mary. I mean, no wonder our jails are full. That takes stupidity to a new level. I mean, that, mm, that's blowing the top off the, the lid right off, man. Probably is taught somewhere. Obviously, I learned it somewhere. That's a, I mean, that's the kind of, really, on the danger side, the danger side of the scale, listen, it, it is, it's, when you read about robbing this and somebody breaking here or some, you know, kidnapping, all kinds of stuff going on, I'm gonna just, now you, just listen to me, ladies. Whether you have any self-defense skills or training whatsoever, and we did something years ago. I brought my jiu-jitsu master in, and we did, uh, we did a, a short seminar, you know, three hours or whatever it was, and one of the, one of the things that he taught was, was so violent that one of the, one of the girls was like, well, we're, you know, you're really going to do that? And he said, do you have any children? She said, yeah, I got a seven-year-old daughter. He said, if someone was, had a knife to your seven-year-old daughter's throat or was going to rape her or something, would you not do this? Well, I guess. Well, I would. So here's the thing. This is, just, and then this is simple. Whether you, have any, whether you have any skills in this arena or not, if, someone, you are in a, if you're in a semi-public place, any place, there's any kind of light, any other people around, a parking lot, uh, a store, a mall, uh, you know, the, the, the underground spaces, parking space, any, anywhere, a, a public street, whatever you do, 
whatever you do, if you are, if you are being attacked or being forced at knife point, at gunpoint, toward a car or your own car, do not go quietly. It's that simple. One of the things that criminals prey on, they prey on people that they think are going to be easy marks. And one of the easiest ways to avoid this is simply to make eye contact with people. Just a simple, just nothing more than that. Now, that's, that's more important maybe sometimes for us as men, but especially for you ladies. Listen, they've talked to criminals. This is a sociological fact. They say, you know, the people that, that had made eye contact with them as they were scanning a bar or standing in a restaurant or a store or something, they don't, for the most part, they don't mess with because they realize there's something. This person's seen me. I've seen them. They're aware. It's the people who are doing this. I got arm full of packages. I got my purse over here. I'm, I'm doing this while I'm walking. I'm not paying attention to anything. And as soon as I'm out the door, boom. If someone comes up to you, listen, you say, oh, my life is at stake. What are the chances that they're going to kill you on the, parking, on, the, on the front steps of Kmart? With the cameras. What are the chances they're going to shoot you right there? Zero. What they want is an easy victim that they can take to the car, rob, possibly rape, molest, whatever the case is, an easy mark where they can potentially get you out somewhere and get away. They don't want to get caught on camera at Walmart shooting somebody in the head. I'm, I'm, I'm so, if you have to fall on the ground and scream and throw a tantrum like a child, whatever you have to do, scream and kick, do not go quietly. Draw as much attention as possible to yourselves. And I would teach your kids the same thing. Whatever basic self-defense you give them, I would also teach them that same thing. You make as much noise as possible. You draw as much attention as possible. As much attention as possible. Ladies, are you with me? I know that, I know fear, uh, uh, you know, kicks in all that stuff, just think, this is my life. This is my life at stake. And then scream, a blood-curdling scream. You know you got it in you. <laughs> I, I, just, I, I mean, we can all do it. I mean, if you, it's, it's called primal fear. It's a fight-or-flight mechanism. And if you are trapped somewhere, I mean, you just cut it loose, man. Scream at the top of your lungs. Okay, there's our that's self-defense. That's what's as simple as calling for help. The Apostle Paul in Romans 10, 13 said, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's, he's quoting from the Old Testament prophet Joel, Joel 2, 32. Now this consists of, this is a simple prayer which can be expressed in the privacy of your own soul. You don't have to say it this way. The person doesn't have to say it this way. This is just the way I phrased it years ago when I put this together and I kind of modified it a little bit. But you can, you can express this prayer openly, inwardly, outwardly. You know, you can be on your knees, you can be sitting in a chair, you can be standing up, you can be raising your hands, lower your hands, have your hands in your pockets. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You can say it alone in your bedroom with nobody else around, the privacy of your own soul, Paul. Simple prayer. God, I believe Jesus was the Son of God and Savior of man. And I'm trusting Him now for the redemption of my sin, for your perfect righteousness. I'm trusting Him to take away my sin, trusting Him to give me your righteousness, and for life eternal. These are the gifts of grace. And we'll see that when we come back to 2 Corinthians 5 next week. That was the second half of last week's message. This is sort of an insertion into the narrative, if you will. We saw two great themes, substitution and reconciliation. We'll finish that next week. But this is, the, this is what God does. He imputes or he credits John to our account, his righteousness and his eternal life. That's the basis of relationship. You and I don't have anything we bring to the table. We have worth and value as his creation, but we don't have any righteousness to bring to the table. Well, here, God, here's all my righteousness. All your righteousness is like a filthy rag, said Isaiah. And, it is, uh, and that's not a pleasant concept when you understand it in the Hebrew. I am trusting him for my redemption, for your righteousness, and for life eternal. With you, Father, all things are possible. It can be something as simple as that right there. It could be even simpler than that. I believe you, Jesus. I love you. I want you to clothe me in your righteousness. However it, your soul frames the words, it's belief, it's trust, it's faith in him and not in self. Just that simple. Salvation is as simple as looking toward the light. Older you get, more light you need to read, right? Simple as looking toward the light. Upon his entry into Jerusalem, Jesus told the nation of Israel, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me will remain in darkness. That implies if you don't believe in me, you are in darkness. But if you believe in me, you will not remain in that darkness. John 12, 46. Earlier in this same passage, he had said to them, put your trust, put your trust, 
Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. I like that. Sons of light. I don't want to be a child of darkness any longer. I want to be a son of light. Salvation, finally, is as simple as believing in Jesus Christ. It is is as simple as believing in Jesus Christ. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God, Jesus his Son. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. He who believes what exactly? In context, he believes that Jesus came forth from the Father as his one and only Son. This is John 6, 46 and 47. The one who believes that Jesus came forth from the Father as his one and only Son has everlasting life. In John chapter 11 and verse 23, you all know this passage. Jesus said this is the, this is the Martha, Mary, and Lazarus passage. you got to imagine. Yeah, think. Lazarus comes out. They tear the grave clothes off of him. He probably laughs at, at the, as loud as his lungs will carry. I mean, what's he have to fear now? I was dead. I'm no longer dead. There's Jesus. We're good. It's all good, brother. Lazarus laughed. The religious leaders, by the way, John tells us, wanted to kill Lazarus as well because he was a testimony to the power of the Messiah. Can you imagine? What do you have to intimidate this man? What can you possibly do? I was dead. That's fine. Kill me again, man. I know where I'm going. I've already been raised from the grave once. This is no problem for God. Do your best. Take your best shot. In John eleven twenty three. Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That is a standard Jewish belief. It is an accurate one. I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. He who believes in me will live spiritually even though he dies physically. And whoever lives physically and believes in me will never die spiritually. You with me? Then he makes the issue what it always is and always has been personal and individual. He asked her, do you believe this? He asked her, Donna, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that. This sounds like Peter, doesn't it? Yes, Lord, I to- I, she told him, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. You got it, sister. You nailed that one. Now, each of the examples and illustrations that I've given you is designed to show the simplicity of faith. If you can come when called, if you can drink water, if you can eat a piece of bread, if you can walk through a door, if you can receive a gift, if you can call for help, if you can look toward the light, you can believe in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Scripture says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. See, faith is trusting what the word of God says. And in the final analysis, it all comes down to this question. In John eleven twenty six, do you believe this? It's not about what your father or grandfather believed, your mother or grandmother. Do you believe this? A man or woman's response to this single solitary question determines their destiny, either eternal glory in heaven or eternal misery in the lake of fire. Legalism in Jesus' day kept many of those in his generation from recognizing and receiving the Son of God. Legalism in Paul's day tried to take those who have been saved by grace. By the way, these are the same group of people, same generation of people. Legalism in the early church in Paul's day tried to take those who have been saved by grace and bind them to a system of rules and rituals and regulations that passed away with the death of Jesus. And legalism in our day, right now in the 21st century, is still the greatest stumbling block to the simplicity of the gospel for the unbeliever and to the spiritual freedom which is the birthright of every child of God in the age of grace. Marshall, can you, can you find that the communion CD for us? Here's what I'm going to do. We got, we've got a meal planned. We have the Lord's table here. We'll move the offering plates back over there. This, uh, is this the wine here or the other side? The first one? Okay. Well, one of these has... Okay. This is wine for those who prefer traditional communion. And this is grape juice for those who don't, right? Now, I'm going to pray for opportunities this week because that's what this message is about. 
opportunities for each of us in our families, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our city, township, village, wherever we live, surrounding areas, central Arkansas, the state, the nation. I'm praying for opportunities for God to open a door of opportunity for each of us, Vernon, and for us to have the courage to unashamedly proclaim the gospel when the opportunity is standing right there in front of us. Hey, these, these kids are in the same boat we're in. They got friends. They're going back to school here before long. They got people they're going to meet, and these kids don't know the Son of God. They don't know Jesus. They have an opportunity to share him by life and by lips. As uh, I can't remember... Oh my gosh, whoever the saint was who said, uh, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use your lips. One guy gets that. How do you do that? Life and lips together. All right, I'm going to pray. I heard somebody gasp <sighs> like that, so I'm going to pray for us. All right. Abba, I love these sheep. But what they need to know, and what I believe they, they are, are learning to experience, is that you love them more than anyone possibly could. Their husbands, their wives, their fathers, their mothers, their children, their cousins, their co-workers, whomever, even their shepherd. You have a deep and passionate love for them. You desire that they would respond to your love by walking in the light, and that they would respond to Jesus' love by sharing Him with someone else. Everyone here knows the the great thrill, the rush of emotion early on in a relationship. You want to tell everybody you know about this man or this woman or this girl or this guy or whomever it is. And you are giddy with elation and emotion. We have lost our first love. Relight our fire. Restore our passion for the Son of God. That is one way that we love Jesus and love Him well, is to introduce people to Him. When you love somebody, you are unashamed to say, this is my beloved. Is Jesus our beloved? Make him so, Father. Make him so. In this moment, we don't, it, doesn't, it shouldn't take years for us to get there. This can happen right now. Open doors of opportunity for us. Holy Spirit, go before us and break through. Break through gates of bronze. Cut through bars of iron. Level the mountains. Raise the valleys and make a Make a level space for us to move into the hearts and lives of others. Open doors of opportunity. Give us the eyes to see them. And give us the courage within our hearts to simply speak what we know. This is what I know about Jesus and his kingdom. Here's the offer. I love you, and I want to see you on the other side. This is how we get there. Jesus is the door. May we bless you. May we praise you. May we honor you, Abba, in this moment. As we gather as a family here to celebrate the sacrifice of the Son of God, may we remember His blood shed on our behalf, cleansing us of our sin. May we remember His broken body given for us in the bread. And may we worship. May we be grateful. I mean joyously grateful. This is not a sad moment. It's not a tearful moment. This is a moment of rejoicing. You've done the work, and we received all the benefit. And we say, thank you. Thank you, thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.